Hey film fans, what if I told you that three years before Desert Hearts, there was a European film about a lesbian relationship combined with political intrigue, investigative journalism, and the search for truth in 1950s Hungary? Some of you might be like, huh, this isn't the one for me. But I hope most of you who've been following my channel right now would be like, wow, that sounds fascinating. What film is that? That's the 1982 film, Another Way, the subject of this episode of What Makes This Film Great. Hey film fans, uh, I'm back after a little hiatus. I haven't made a video for about a month because it was a crazy August and early September. All kinds of stuff going on. I traveled a little bit to Budapest. I actually filmed there. I put up one short video about Chinatown but I did a bunch of filming on the streets and in and around Budapest because I was going to do a film, a video on, um, on Budapest on film, but it was my first time <laughs> filming outside and the sound quality was awful and yeah, it wasn't going to be a good video. I will put some of it up on my Patreon, which don't even think about that yet, but I'll have more to say about that sometime this winter, I think. And most recently, a gung gung gung, we got a puppy. So if you hear yipping, barking, or a little boy scream because the puppy still hasn't learned how to bite appropriately, um, that's what that is. Uh, if you hear the scream, I'm gonna have to turn the video off. Um, but I'm back and I plan to start making videos again at least once a week, maybe twice a week um, throughout the autumn and winter. I'm, I'm teaching a little bit this autumn, so it'll depend on, on how that goes. Anyway. It's nice to see you all out there. Thanks for sticking with me. So, Another Way. It's a 1982 film and it's directed by the Hungarian filmmaker Karoly Mok. I talked about one of his films, Love, this winter, um, which is a very different film, but shares with Another Way um, the use of relationships, romantic, sexual relationships as a way to explore political repression. I'll get more into that in a minute. It's based on a novel or probably a novella by Erzsébet Galgotzi and, and Galgotzi was a lesbian writer in Hungary who lived through the 50s and 60s and up until much later um, and she wrote the book translated into English as Another Love the Hungarian title is more like Within the Law or something like that, and we'll get to that, um, about her experiences of being a lesbian during the sort of stricter, more to totalitarian years of Hungarian communism. And Mach decided to make it into a film in the early 80s, and he and Galgotzi actually co-wrote the script together. So. It is a film about a lesbian love affair directed by a straight man, but the script is coming from Gal Gozzi and her novella. So there is some influence of the person who actually wrote it, this lesbian woman, on the making of the film. Um, does it matter? I'll come back to that question in just a minute. When it comes to the film's cast, it gets a little bit tricky. The two main characters are Ava and Livia, and they're both performed by Polish actors. And that uh, there's a lot of speculation about why that was. The film scholar Aniko Imre um, posits that most Hungarian women performers in the 80s wouldn't have felt comfortable playing open lesbians and performing um, a lesbian erotic scene, let's say. It's not really quite a sex scene, but there's a lot of kind of erotica or erotic leaning moments in the film as the relationship develops. Ava, the, I guess we could call the protagonist, but my Polish pronunciation is not even so-so. So apologies to any fans from Poland who might be watching this, like, Arr! if you want to tell me how to say these names correctly, I'm, I'm open to, to learning. Uh, Anyhow, Ava is played by Jadwiga Jankowska Cieslak, and Livia is played by Grażnia Sapolska. Now, these are Polish performers, 
uh, who didn't speak Hungarian, the film is in Hungarian, so there are actually voice actors. And the voice actor of Eva is the Hungarian performer um, Ildiko Bonshagi, and the voice actor of Livia is Judith Hernadi. And um, this is something I just wanted to mention briefly because it's actually quite typical in European cinema, especially kind of late 20th century European cinema. The European film industries, most of them, developed around post-synchronous sound. So even when you had um, an Italian actor delivering his lines, the lines were often re-recorded after the fact and synced with the performance. Whereas in Hollywood, um, from the 30s on, sync sound recording became de rigueur for the most part. Um, one of the side benefits of the European approach was that Italian film, Hungarian film, Spanish film, could use actors from other nations who didn't speak the language. And the way their cinema apparatuses were set up was that it was easy to post sync the sound with a performer like Bonshaki Ildiko or something like that. And so you will see if you watch another way that the, <laughs> there's a little bit of discrepancy between the dialogue that you're hearing and the way that the performers are, are moving their lips. And it's not just with the two main performers, performers Erdős, who is an important character I'll talk about. He's the, the editor of this newspaper around which the whole story um, uh, takes place he is actually a Slovakian performer named Josef Kroner and he's voiced by a guy named Jula Sabo. So you have the three main characters in the film are actually played by non-Hungarian actors and then there are two great Hungarian actors, one of the other journalists who's played by and then Livia's husband, Dunsi, who's played by Peter Andorai. It's an interesting mix of people, and I, I've often wondered when I watch films like this, like, how did the director do this? How did he direct them? There must have been translators on set. But you have scenes where, you know, um, Dunsi is Hungarian, and he's speaking in Hungarian, and Livy, the performer, is Polish, and she's speaking in Polish, and they're acting their scenes together. So it must have been interesting because it comes across very well. The performances are great. In fact, Jan Costa Cislak won an award for her performance in this film at the Cannes Film Festival that year. So what is the film about? It is set in 1958 in Hungary, and the film announces this immediately. So you get these gunshots and then this title, 1958. And for a Hungarian audience, even today, that joining of those two, the sound of the gunshots and the 1958, carry a lot of meaning. And just a quick historical diversion here, and I've talked about this in some of my other videos about Hungarian cinema. In 1956, there was a revolution in Hungary and it was an anti-Soviet revolution. I don't want to talk about it too much. This is not a history video, but it's important to the plot of the film. So in 1953, Stalin died, and he was replaced by Nikita Khrushchev, who underwent a process of what's often called de-Stalinization. I'm not a historian, um, so you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the gist of that is that while Khrushchev intended to maintain a firm grip on the Communist Party and for communism, Soviet-style communism, to maintain the order of the day or to remain the order of the day, he wanted to open it up a little bit. They talk about this process of opening it up. And he opened up, for example, a lot of archives that let the world know about atrocities committed during the, the Stalin regime. And this had a variety of effects on the satellite countries and the Soviet sphere countries, like what was then Czechoslovakia, um, Yugoslavia, which was a little outside the sphere anyway already under Tito, and Hungary. And Hungary elected a reformist uh, prime minister, Imre Naj, and they started to make reforms. And there was some resistance to those reforms, and I'm giving the, the, like, the simplest version of this. And in 56, Hungarians took the to the streets and decided what they really wanted. While they wanted to maintain a socialist government, they wanted to remove the Soviets. 
remove the Soviet army, remove the Soviet tanks, and so on. And it's important to remember that for the film, if not for history, that Naj, Imre Naj, was a socialist. He still wanted to have a socialist Hungary, but he didn't want the sort of totalitarian nature of it, the Stalinist nature of it. And that becomes a very important part of the film. And the reason for that, the revolution was crushed. It was brutally crushed by the Soviets. It didn't take long, about a month, tanks rolled in and the, the Soviet army came and Hungarians en masse were arrested or had to flee the country and some of them were, were killed. Uh, incidentally, for film history, two who left the country were the great cinematographers Laszlo Kovács and, and Vilmo Zsigmond who made their way to America and helped to create 1970s Hollywood. That's a different story. Um, and so the, the participants in the revolution, some of whom were very important Hungarian, uh, academics and scholars, um, uh, politicians, journalists, um, and so on, the key figures in Hungarian life who the country kind of needed to keep going were allowed to come out of prison if they renounced their participation in the revolution, which was now uh, deemed a counter-revolution because the Soviet communist project is the revolution. So this thing that was against it was a counter-revolution. So in a way, reactionary. And a lot of people did. They came out and kind of renounced it so that they could have their lives back. And that's Erdős, the editor of the journal or newspaper, which is called Truth, that uh, Ava and Livia work at. So this is kind of the background. Erdős was part of the revolution. He's dedicated to creating a more open society, but he's been in prison. He was almost executed, in fact. One of the ways that he and Ava get to know each other early on is that she knows his history, which very few people do, and he's impressed by her as a journalist for discovering that. So this is kind of the setting for the film, but what is the film about? There are two strands to the story of Another Way, and they're tightly interwoven because both involve Ava. Ava is a young journalist dedicated to uncovering the truth and telling the truth. And in that sense, she's a lot like many journalists in uh, Hollywood films, you know, the, the um, Woodward and Bernstein of All the President's Men. She thinks that couching the truth, that covering up parts of the truth and only telling the convenient parts are really despicable. Like she is dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge and truth and to the telling of knowledge and truth. She is also a socialist. She's asked at one point why she didn't rejoin the party after 56. And she says, not because I'm against communism, but she says, I don't wanna rejoin a party that's in danger of becoming what it was before 56 when we had a revolution. She believes in a sort of purer or truer and definitely more open socialism. So this makes her in the years after 56, when the Communist Party in Hungary is trying to reestablish its dominance, this makes her problematic. So we find out early in the film that she has not worked for two years, that she's bounced around from job to job, and Erdős is taking a risk in hiring her because he admires her tenacity. And I think, although the film never states this, he sees something of his young self in her, his, his, that, that dogged pursuit of the truth. He's certainly protective of her throughout the film, even when he's stern. And he certainly feels like he wants to give her as many breaks as he possibly can without going to prison again himself. And this will become important later. Ava is also a lesbian and she's pretty open about it. Um, people ask her uh, if she's married. She says, I love women. Erdős knows that this kind of reputation has followed her around. Homosexuality is not okay in this era of communist Hungary and it's meant to be hidden at best or repressed um, 
ideally, you know. So Ava is quite open about it. That I mean, she doesn't shout it from the rooftops, but she doesn't hide it. Um, so she has um, two sides <laughs> of her that are problematic for the conservative power structure. So she begins a new job at Truth, and there she meets Livia. Livia is a little bit more conservative. She dresses conservatively. conservatively. She is also a journalist at the newspaper. Um, she's married to Dunsi, and Dunsi's an army officer. And Erdush knows them well. He knows Dunsi. It's not said why, but maybe from his time in prison. He certainly knows Livia from having worked with her. And at the beginning of the film, Livia seems quite content, but she is immediately attracted to Ava. And we see that first, somewhat subtly, in their first meeting in an elevator. There you can see there's just a little bit of sort of, hmm, what's this all about? And then soon after, there's the first journalistic meeting and Ava is already, she's only just been hired and she's professing this, this need or this desire to push the journal towards telling the truth more often. And Livia is fascinated by her character, as we see here. Yeah, Liva, we'll I mean it. Már elnézést kérek, de... Nekünk itt az volna a feladatunk, hogy az igazságot írjuk meg. Ha ez még sincs így, annak véleményem szerint két oka van alapvetően. Az első ok az, hogy mi újságírók nem ismerjük eléggé az életet. És, és nem is fogjuk, mert azok, akik ebben segítségünkre lehetnének, úgy csapnak be, ahogy akarnak. Én gondolok itt a járási titkárokra, gyárigazgatókra, művelődési osztályvezetők. So this is one of the main strands of narrative in the story. Slowly, these two women are going to fall in love. The other narrative strand concerns a story that Ava is very interested in. She's brought it with her to the newspaper. She wants to pursue it, and she's allowed to pursue it. And this is a little complicated if you don't know much about kind of 50s and 60s Central European history and the Sovietization of Central Europe. But basically, in Hungary, in the conversion to communism, there were a tenacious group of private farmers and landowners who were resistant to collectivization, right? And slowly what the Soviet system was about was the collectivization of labor and agriculture. And Hungary has a huge agricultural base and eventually it was, for the most part, kind of collectivized and Sovietized. In the countryside, Ava's heard stories about how the co-ops who are running that collectivization are forcing farmers to join the co-op. The government is saying, oh, look at all the farmers, they're so happy to join the co-op because it makes everyone happy workers sharing the labor together, sharing the fruits of the labor together. Rah, rah, socialism, aren't we great? And Ava's like, that's not what's happening. They're being forced. It's against their will. This is exactly what we fought against in 56, and it's happening again. If we don't tell the truth about this, there, we might have another 56 on our hands. So she's pragmatic in her pursuit of the story. Like, why don't we just do the right thing? Because it will be better for the country. But also, as a journalist in her dedication to truth, she believes the story has to be told. And a lot of the film concerns her attempts to tell that story as truthfully as she can. And Erdős's um, resistance, compassionate resistance, but resistance. He says at one point, "Maga és én csak akkor tudjuk tovább vinni ezt a lapot és végezni a tenni valónkat. A képesek vagyunk egy bizonyos x mennyiségű okos kompromisszumra. És értelmesen csupán arról vitatkozhatunk, hogy meghatározzuk végül is mennyi legyen az az x. 
És úgy gondolja, hogy az asztória ügy már túl van. Túl van. És miért? Meddig játsszuk még azt, hogy ami kellemetlen, az gyorsan bevágjuk a fiókba, vagy besöpörjük a szőnyeg alá? Jaj, Éva, addig, ameddig muszáj. Amíg ezt követeli tőlünk a helyzet. Milyen helyzet? Mondja maga, valóban nem érzi. Nem érti, hogy a most és az itt kimondható igazságoknak valahol határa van az Isteni magán. In other words, you have to choose your battles. Um, Eva can't live with this, she's a purist. Where the, the, the strands connect, well, it's, it's, there are multiple connecting strands, but for the overarching plot of the story is that the authorities are getting tired of her. They're getting tired of her um, raising a fuss and they're aware of her lesbianism. And we find out at one point in the story, we meet an old friend of Ava's who's also a lesbian who explains that they're putting people, women who love women, in jail. Ihattok egy kis rumot? Tölts magadnak. Képzeld, rám állítottak két nyomozót, hogy szervezzenek be spiclinek. Állandóan a nyomomban vannak. Most itt? Nem. Nem kell megijedned. Most sikerült megszöknöm előlük. Ígérnek fűt, fát. Például mit? Lakást, állást a szakmámban. Megzsarolnak. Nem csak a politikai múltammal, hanem hogy... azzal is, hogy nőket szeretek. So this becomes convenient for the authorities that it's hard for them right now because they're trying to put a good face on the new Hungary to arrest her for um, her journalism. But her lesbianism presents an opportunity for them to make her life more difficult. It's never spelled out explicitly, but there's an awareness of it in all the conversations we see of the kind of higher-ups. We need to talk a little bit about the film's presentation of lesbianism because there are two tropes that run through the film that became symbolic by the 80s of what you could do in a lesbian film, especially directed by a straight person, a straight male. Um, and those two tropes definitely have a negative reputation today for probably good reason, but also I think might color this film's reception because of their negative reputation. And we can maybe speculate a little bit about does the film finesse them or not? Um, and I'm sure a lot of people think no. Um, I know, for example, Aniko Imre, who I mentioned earlier, thinks no. Um, but let's just talk about them. The first one is the tragic or dead lesbian trope. Ava dies. This is not a spoiler. In fact, the first thing we see in the film is the discovery of Ava's body with a gunshot wound to the head. It's not a gory, you know, <laughs> Tarantino gunshot wound, but there's a gunshot wound to her head and the guards find her they read her name and we know that she's dead. And then we meet Livia and she's in a hospital and she's severely injured. And the rest of the film becomes a flashback that leads us up to this point. So throughout the film's entire runtime, we know that Ava's going to die. And this is the tragic or dead lesbian trope. And it's problematic for a lot of people because it was the way that mainstream filmmakers often got away with showing lesbian stories without too much um, censorious backlash. Like everyone had this sort of titillated, including characters in the film, like, ooh, let's watch the lesbians, but let's not normalize it. How can we not normalize it? Kill one of them, right? Make this love affair and in tragedy. It's one of the things that Donna Deitch rebelled against when she made Desert Hearts. She said, I want to show a lesbian romance that doesn't end in tragedy. 
and, and that was important to her because of films like this. I don't know if she had seen another way, um, but if she had, she would probably think, there's another one. The second trope is the bisexual trope. I mean, to cast no aspersions uh, to bisexuals or bisexuality, but it was a trope that was often used, and it, it comes up in this film as well, where there's a clear, and this could be in films about gay men as well, um, lesbian, and there's a heterosexual, maybe bisexual woman who is tempted by the allure of the lesbian witchery <laughs> or something like this. So that the, the problem with this trope is that lesbianism then becomes almost like, like witchcraft or like something that can infect the good and pure uh, heterosexual woman. Or at the very worst, the heterosexual woman is playing, experimenting. And by the end of the film, she learns her lessons and recalibrates her sexuality towards heterosexuality. Livia does not get that ending for reasons that uh, I'll leave you to discover, but um, her ending is in some ways more tragic than Ava's, although Ava ends up dead, so I don't know how you can get more tragic than that, but Livia's ending is, is quite tragic as well. So the film <laughs> standard lesbian tropes that, if you poke them even a little bit, portray lesbianism as a something to be cured, something to be solved, something to be removed. And that's the reason these two tropes have such negative reputations today. And it, it makes complete and total sense. Does this film finesse them? Is it worth checking out anyway? It depends how much you buy the relationship and it depends how much you buy the way the film marries the relationship with the politics and the politics of repression that it's depicting in late 50s Hungary. The relationship between Ava and Livia or Livy is quite complex because it, it takes this kind of on again, off again pattern, not so much like a rom-com or something like that, but more that Livia, and Livia I think is my kind of favorite character in the film, is she's overwhelmed by this. This is a new feeling for her. And when she commits to it, she likes it, but she's living in 1958 Budapest. She's afraid. She's living a comfortable life with an army officer husband. It's implied that they go out to dinner a lot. She has nice clothes. Is she gonna have to give that up? But she's also falling in love with Ava and she recognizes it as love. So they have this kind of tenuous dance of a relationship that is often interrupted because of Livia's trepidation, but also because of external factors. So they meet in the offices of the journal, and then one day they go swimming together at the swimming pool, and um, it becomes clear there that there's a flirtation, they go out for a drink, and then they go to a park bench at night, and we get this scene. Then does she? Kérem a személyi igazolványokat. Maga férjes asszony, miért keveredik ilyesmibe? Ez az én dolgom. Ha még egyszer rajta kapjuk, hogy ilyesmit csinál, meg fogjuk mondani a férjének, megértette? És a felettesének. Menjen haza. Maga velünk jön. Nem tudom, joguk van-e maguknak így bánni velem. Nem vagyunk Amerikában, mozgás!
everything about that is kind of skeezy and it's representative of the way the infrastructure of um, the political apparatus, the social apparatus in Hungary at the time, is going to work throughout the film to keep these women separate. Here it's the police and they, they know who these women are. They're both journalists for an important journal, plus Livia, like I said, is married to an army officer. They let her go, but with that stern warning, we're going to tell your husband. They arrest Eva, although only briefly, but they give her her, her own warning that like, you know, don't tempt our women, which, um, and that drives Livia away. And then she comes back again. And each time she comes back, she makes a bigger commitment. The relationship gets more physical. She talks more and more about how much she admires Ava, how much she loves Ava, eventually how much she needs Ava. But she, she remains torn. At the same time, we begin to see that Dunsi, her husband, it's not, this isn't like the happiest of marriages. So once she starts to have feelings for Ava, she starts to kind of wonder what's going on. And she wants to go out with, to dinner with Dunsi just to have a kind of date. To, to sort of reset her balance. Uh, but he has other things on his mind. Sokszor arra gondolok, hogy a szolgálat miatt túl sokat vagy egyedül. Én nem tudom, mi van velem. Mostanában folyton aludnék. No, me ayudan. So this aggression, well, it's an it's an aggression combined with a sort of passive aggression, will continue with his character throughout the film, and he's he becomes increasingly definitely emotionally emotionally abusive, gaslighty, but also by the end physically more than abusive, physically a threat to her. So as the film progresses, we start to see that this the surface of a happy loving couple that it presents at the beginning scratch and underneath it's not as happy and loving as it appeared. But Livy's still confused because she believes she's meant to follow that role. So this is what she has to come back to. And eventually she's going to prefer to move in the direction of Ava, but it takes her some time. Um, there are two important kind of set pieces that I wish I could talk about forever, but I'm going to make it brief, uh, where their love becomes manifest. The first is when Ava and Livia and another journalist, Fiala, travel to the countryside to investigate these co-ops and to find out were the former were the farmers forced to join them this is quite a long set piece it includes um this wonderful scene after the long day of travel where ava helps livy take her boots off Örülök, hogy eljöttél. most már én is And they've kissed before, but this is their first sort of physical intimacy. And I love the way the scene is shot and I love the way they, they perform this. Um, but the main set piece here is this big dance party restaurant where all the farmers are getting drunk and the journalists are there. And Livy dances in these sort of Hungarian folk dances with almost all the men. And she has fun, but it looks like she's putting on an act. And, and it's never presented uh, specifically, or it's never detailed why she does this. But it seems to me that she's actually performing a role because while she's doing all this, Ava is interviewing different people and finding out the story. And she finds out that she's right, that these uh, farmers, these independent farmers were brought to Budapest. They were put in a hotel, the Astoria Hotel, still there. And 
basically told you can leave when you join the co-op and they they debated this for a week and finally they agreed and they they left um and it's a lot more complicated than that but that she gets the story while Livia is kind of distracting everybody. The next set piece that's really important happens in the countryside in a different location at Ava's house. And she has left the newspaper and she's been writing letters. We get these voiceover moments. She's writing letters to Livia like, I love you, why haven't you come to see me? And finally, Livia, who's been resisting again because Ava's reputation has taken a hit and she journeys to the countryside. And this is when they, I guess you could say, consummate their love and it's a really tender and beautifully shot scene of physical intimacy between these two women there they're funny they're in bed it's cute it's it's really really lovely and it seems like at this moment finally livia commits and this is where their lives are going to go from here tragically that's not the case the reason Ava's is in the countryside at her mother's house is because erdush in the end refuses to run the story He'll run it modified, but he wants to take out all the stuff about the hotel and the, the forcing of these farmers to join the co-op. And to Ava, that's the story. And again, she's like, how can we do this? How can we not tell the truth? He's like, look, the story's great. Your writing's, he, he really cares for her. But this is when he, he says, as I showed you earlier, you have to choose your battles. I can't run this story. Um, and he's going to get political heat for running the edited story anyway when this sort of party flack shows up and says, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, hey, man, this is the story. We have to, we have to tell the truth about this sort of stuff. So he kind of takes on Ava's position, even though he's cut out the meat of the story. But Ava quits and she goes to the countryside. And that's when Livia joins her. And, and it's that story of her search for truth and her 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 hard-earned righteousness that is going to kind of lead to the the film's tragic end so she does die and she is a lesbian so she is punished but she's punished because of her politics and she's punished because of her journalism is that enough to sort of circumvent this dead lesbian trope, this awful trope? I don't know. I think you have to watch it and decide for yourself. What's interesting to me is that Mock always said, he died about five years ago, I think 2015, six years ago, uh, always said that to him, the lesbian story wasn't actually that interesting. To him, it was the journalistic search for truth and the showing the repression of the 50s. And, and you see something similar, as I said, in his film Love, which was made about 10 years before this. And in a way, I think that makes the lesbian story stronger. I could be wrong about it. I could just like this film and maybe I'm making excuses for it. It happens. But, I mean, he, the film treats Ava as, well, yeah, she's lesbian, whatever. There's no, throughout the film, there's no judgment of her from the film. In fact, the film shows other women flirting with her, hitting on her, and her response is sometimes welcoming and sometimes, no, I'm, I'm working on something else over here. And none of this is de depicted as strange. At one point when she and Livy are flirting together in the bar that they frequent, you get this. <laughs> <laughs> but the old woman, it seems clear to me, is not saying, oh, it's so unfortunate for them that they're lesbians inherently. It's that, it's, this is Budapest in 1958. That's a hard road to go down. Um, and the film seems sympathetic for them. Erdős is totally sympathetic at one point when one of the party flax is quizzing him about how could you hire this lesbian woman? He says, I didn't hire her for what she does in bed. I hired her for her writing. And that seems sort of de rigueur to most of the people in the film. Um, and I think that's in part because Mock wasn't interested in, in exploring the sort of anti lesbian, anti-LGBT 
environment of Hungary. It's there in the film, obviously. Um, but he's more interested in exploring the mechanics of, you know, free speech, free journalism, freedom of the press, and so on. Um, and you have to remember, he's making this film in a 1982 Hungary that's still under the communist regime. It's opened up some, but like a lot of Hungarian films, this film about 56 or 58 is an allegory for today or for what was then the early 80s. Um, so he is taking a risk making this film. He's taking a risk making a film about, you know, that's critical of the party machinations after 56. And he, he is taking a risk making a film about lesbian relationships. Um, Aniko Immer gets a little upset in one of her articles justly, I think, for how much praise he got for being a brave man for telling the story when there were so many uh, women in Hungary who were being repressed still at that time because they loved women. Um, but does it skirt these two tropes? I'm not sure. By the end, Livy is brokenhearted. She's downcast. She wants to reject the story that's happened to her. It's not made clear that she wants to reject loving women. We don't know. She is told you'll never again have the life you had. Um, it's not specified why, but maybe that's it. Or maybe she's just become sort of persona non grata to the state, so she can't work anymore. It's not clear. It's just implied that it's very tragic. Um, I don't know. Maybe this, this, this film is a hotbed of, of negative lesbian tropes. And um, I saw it at a time when I was very affected by it. And so it's remained close to my heart. But I think the story that it's trying to tell is one of how political repression touches the lives of good and caring people who in this case happen to be two women in love. And it's very relevant to today's Hungary where there is a move to repress public expressions of affection, teaching about gay life, teaching about gay parents, teaching about transgenderism. There was an anti-transgender law passed just this summer, in the summer of 2021. So we can go, wow, man, life was tough in the 50s, but this hasn't gone away. And in that sense, I think the film is quite sort of topical today. And, and it is quite moving and it is depressing. So be prepared for that. I wanted to say one last thing about the film, and that's its use of music, which I think is quite interesting and ingenious because it has a few different musical motifs running throughout. Um, there is a kind of classical acoustic guitar that plays at certain scenes in the film, and this is often used to imply like a somber tone. So we hear this at times when the characters are being very reflective, for example. <laughs> Then <laughs> there's this very sort of sexy 80s jazz saxophone that I think is meant to be sultry. And this comes up early in the film, even before uh, Ava and Livia establish their relationship together. We see it when they first meet in the elevator. <laughs> This just reminds me of 80s movies so much that, um, how can we show sex? Sax, sax equals sex, right? <laughs> and we get this every time the, the couple has kind of broken it off and then they come back together, that sax comes in like, you know where this is going, right? This is, lends a little bit of 80s eroticism to it. It might be a little bit dated, except that the, the sax playing is, is so good. It's performed by a guy named Laszlo Desch, who's a great Hungarian musician. And then there is the piano bar. And the piano bar is the site of a lot of important scenes. It's where Livy and Ava first start to touch and first start to have any kind of physical intimacy. And it's also the scene where we see that there are other women who are interested in women. For example, one of those waitresses that we saw earlier sort of looking disapprovingly later, she's actually quite interested in something with, with Ava and Ava will respond to her positively later in the film. Oh. Oh. 
Kérem, tegye el. Köszönöm. And then later we also see this. So all of this happens in this piano bar, which is also where the journalists go after work to hang out. There's a lot of scenes there. And there's this man playing piano. And he plays a few different songs throughout the film, kind of jazz standards. But one of the songs he plays is... This is a famous Hungarian song. It was written by, the music was written by a man named uh, Reza Sheresh in 1933. And it's a sad song about a love who never arrives. And the song kind of implies that the, the narrator or the singer, this is their last day of life. And this became known in the 30s and 40s, again, it's not funny, 30s and 40s as the Hungarian suicide song. In fact, Billie Holiday did a famous version of it in English in 1941. And if you look at her record of it, it says, it actually says right on there, the Hungarian suicide song. There were urban legends throughout the 30s and they still persist that people listen to that song and when the song was released in different countries in their national languages that there was an uptick in suicide. I don't think there's any actual factual um, information sort of supporting that, but that's the story that it actually drove sad people to take their own lives. So putting that song throughout the film, um, and it's not a suicide film, but putting that song throughout the film lends it an air of tragedy. And it's interesting that that song plays throughout the wine bar scenes, because these are the scenes where early in the film, Ava's at her most happiest, always drinking cognac. And later in the film where she often sits and waits like the singer of the song and Livia doesn't show up for one reason or another. And she becomes increasingly sort of depressed. And these three musical motifs play throughout the film. So we get the, the sad classical guitar, we get the sexy sultry jazz, and then we get the piano rendition of Gloomy Sunday. And they all add weight to the narrative as good music should. We also get that wonderful sort of Hungarian folk music during the dance scene. So I don't know if I've sold this film to you. I think it's a fascinating film. It's, it's, Politics, even if you don't really understand what's happening in 1958, it's the way that it blends this sort of depiction of journalistic integrity, the, the, the politics of um, behind closed doors, twisted arm politics, um, the lies of the state, and this delicate, I think, for the most part, unpredictable, despite the existence of these two heavy-handed tropes, love story between Ava and Livia and the way those things are all interwoven it's it's really well plotted and it's really well shot and edited um so that you get I think a delicate film that walks close to the traps of pre-80s or really even pre-90s lesbian cinema but in my reading it skirts them barely but it skirts them if you've seen the film and you have any thoughts about it, I'd love to know what you think. So drop a comment below and tell me if you know I'm way off base on this or if you think this is a great film or if you're just interested in seeing it. Like a lot of great Hungarian films from the last 40 or 50 years, you can get um, a DVD of it from Second Run, who does a lot of really good Central and Eastern European films. And it, it's, it, it's a nice... Um, edition. It comes with this booklet that sort of discusses the film. There they are. And it comes with an interview with, with um, Karo and Mach. And check that out. That's all for now, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I'm back. I'll be here all fall, all winter, all spring. And I'd love if you support the channel in any way you can. You can uh, leave a comment. You can hit like. Please hit subscribe if you've watched this far. Um, having, as you know, as every YouTuber says, <laughs> higher subscriber numbers really help my channel out a lot. So if you, if you like what you're watching, please hit the subscribe button and, and share with your friends.
But that's all for now. Until next time, my name's Aaron Hunter. Please keep watching movies.